Hello and welcome to another episode of the Purvis Versus podcast. My name is Eric Purvis. I am an RMT, course creator, continuing education provider, and advocate for evidence-based massage therapy. In this episode, we welcome Susan Shipton from Toronto, Ontario, to discuss a number of topics, including oncology massage and continuing education for RMTs. Thanks for listening. All right, today we have the wonderful Susan Shipton here to talk to us about uh, being a con ed provider, probably amongst uh, many other things. Uh, it should be a great conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I've known Susan since approximately 2017. I think she took a couple courses that I taught in Toronto with the wonderful Monica Noy. And since then, we've become friends, and we actually run a clinical coaching and, and mentoring program together, uh, which is a lot of fun. And that's something we'll probably talk about in another episode. Maybe we can talk about that program, uh, tell people more about what, what we do with that. But today, uh, we're going to talk to you about uh, your journey into being a, we're going to say, relatively new uh, CEC and instructor, professional development instructor. So just uh, introduce yourself, Susan. Tell us a little bit about you. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me here, Eric. Uh, so my name is Susan Shipton, and I'm a massage therapist in Toronto, coming up on my 10-year anniversary. I've been an RMT since 2012. And um, my practice focuses on working with people through all stages of cancer and beyond. And, and interestingly, that was something that I identified that I really wanted to do when I was a student at Sutherland Chan School. And I can't remember exactly why it came to me. Um, Sutherland Chan is, they told us, the only massage school in the world that offers for its students a post-surgical breast massage clinic. And um, so that serves mostly women who have been through treatment for breast cancer, but anybody who's had surgery to the breast or chest area. So we had uh, we had some men who had been diagnosed with breast cancer. We had some women who'd had cosmetic surgeries to their breasts. But as I said, it was largely women who had been treated for breast cancer. And I remember when I was accepted into that student clinic and was thrilled because I really, really wanted to work with this population. I think the reason I wanted to work with people with cancer was because I knew that I wanted to work with people at the confluence of the physical and the emotional. That uh, to me, not to diminish other injuries or health conditions, but say somebody who ruptured, injured their meniscus in a ski accident, it, it wasn't the same kind of experience as somebody who'd been diagnosed with cancer and who was potentially facing a life altering disease and a treatment that would take them possibly up to a year to complete and um, would affect them their sense of of themselves and their mortality and their body and with breast cancer specifically their sense of femininity and their sense of sexuality and perhaps their their um, maternal role in the in the world and and so there was a much more complex and layered experience going on for the individual than um, a simpler more tissue based injury and repair and indeed that has been my experience and. And I think that this has really made my career and I, I really love, I really love this. Wow. And so for, for 10 years, you say you've been practicing, have you been, has your practice pretty much since day one been focused on, on this population? Um, no, when I first started out, I was working at a multidisciplinary clinic offering massage for all the usual reasons people come in for massage. Interestingly, at, in the beginning, because the, uh, one of the owners of the clinic was a naturopath who focused on women's health and infertility. Um, I did a lot of prenatal massage because women were coming and then they would get pregnant and then they, they would seek massage. I also at that time started working part-time at an infertility clinic. So in my early days, I did a bit more of that kind of work, but um, I knew I, I did target people with cancer um, as a population. I wanted to work with right from the beginning. I um, created a brochure um, about the benefits of massage for people with breast cancer specifically. And I tried to distribute it to um, the cancer network within Toronto. So patient support groups like Wellspring or Toronto Rehab, which has a breast cancer program. Um, I tried to approach some of the breast cancer programs at the Toronto hospitals or um, local GPs in the area of my clinic to let them know 
that I was there and I had this specific training and an interest in working with this population. Um, and then very shortly after that, I started my training with the Botter School to become certified in managing lymphedema. So manual lymph drainage and compression, bandaging and garments and skin care and exercise. And I completed that. I did that week by week, the way they offer it. You can do it the four weeks together, but um, I most people do one week and then one week several months later. So it gets spread out. So I completed that in June of 2015. And at that point, in early 2015, I started working at a fantastic clinic called Toronto Physiotherapy, which is well established in Toronto as a cancer rehab clinic and has um, made great inroads with, again, the cancer community in Toronto, with the patient support groups and the rehabilitation centers and oncologists and plastic surgeons. And so gets a lot of referrals specifically to the clinic. And at that point, I just, at least half of my practice was people with cancer um, or with lymphedema, you can have lymphedema completely unrelated to cancer. Um, and so then I just was exposed to so many different people and, and all kinds of different complications that result from the treatment of cancer. And that was a fantastic, fantastic learning ground. The owners of the clinic are very research and evidence-based and they write a fantastic blog, which is on the Toronto Physiotherapy website. Um, looking at recent research into different aspects of cancer care, cancer complications, cancer treatments. And that's a fantastic resource for patients, but also is another draw for people who are just Googling and looking for information and for care. So I, I feel really privileged that I had that opportunity to be part of that really stellar team. And as I said, I learned so, so much. Is it uh, true that you might be moving to your own location though now? Are you opening up your own little practice? It is true. It is true. Um, January 2023, I will be um, launching out on my own um, as a sole proprietor and, and renting a room, um, again, with a clinic, with a physiotherapist and a chiropractor, but um, those two professionals don't have a, a focus on cancer the way the clinic that I'm at right now does. But I, I am planning on continuing to work with this population and um, will make that a focus of my marketing and my outreach to the cancer community in Toronto to let them know of my new location. Amazing. Amazing. One, one thing I guess I was curious about too would be the, uh, as an RMT and you, with your focus on oncology, is there specific like courses or education that you can pursue to learn more about that? Or is it more kind of like self-directed and, or like just on the job kind of learning? Well, when I first became an RMT um, at the end of 2012, and for a few years after that, um, there was a CE course that was offered by uh, Pam Hammond, who's a very experienced RMT and CDT, Combined Decongestive Therapist. So that's the training in uh, managing lymphedema. She also works part-time in the lymphedema clinic at Princess Margaret Hospital, which is Toronto's cancer hospital. So she used to offer a CE course. She hasn't in many, many years. And um, I see now a big gap in um, evidence-based substantial education for RMTs on working with people with cancer. And, and that's where I'd really like to step in and fill that gap because I think even if, unlike me, you have targeted this population, the reality is that one in five people in Canada will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lifetime. And so any RMT who has long-term clientele will most likely work with people who have cancer. And, and I think that there's so much that massage therapy can offer people with cancer through um, helping alleviate specific complications from the treatment to providing much needed um, kind, nurturing touch and, and um, support and relaxation during what is inevitably quite a stressful and difficult time. So I, I really feel quite passionate about this. We have so much to offer and I want RMTs to feel a lot more confident and prepared to to help their clients who are going through cancer. When you did your your master's program, did you get to? I know it was mostly on an interprofessional kind of pain management stuff. Were you able to do any research or any papers on oncology and massage and, and pain? I guess related from that. Um, no, not not specifically, and it's not something that I specifically pursued during that master's program. Um, what I think is interesting, though, is when talking about pain, people often isolate cancer-related pain. 
So they might talk about non-cancer pain. <laughs> but I didn't find in um, the presentations that we had in that program that anybody talked specifically about cancer-related pain. Um, in my experience as an RMT, um, pain can result from the surgery to treat cancer, sometimes from the radiation to treat cancer. Certainly there's, there can be a large psycho-emotional pain and distress. Um, and a lot of people experience depression and anxiety as they go through the treatment. And that's where massage can be really beneficial. Um, more specifically, when cancer enters the bones, whether it's a primary bone cancer or it's um, cancer metastasis to the bones, that can be really, uh, really very painful. And um, patients are usually given, um, they're usually treated with pharmaceuticals that they're oncologists, or they are referred to a pain management clinic and they are given pharmaceuticals to manage the, the, can the bone cancer related pain. Right. Yeah. You see that all the time in, in the research, don't you? You see that there's, you know, be like non-malignant back pain or, you know, yeah. it's always like non-malignant or non-cancerous pain. Like it's like these two separate things. I, I, Worlds. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know, actually, this is the first time I've really thought about why they do that, but I guess they're doing that to try to move it away from a specific known bio, biological driver. Maybe that's why they, they label it as malignant versus non-malignant. Do you know anything yes. about that? That's probably why, right? I assume. Uh, that, that's what I've always imagined. Um, yeah. But as I said, th this is a funny thing for me to say, given that my my practice focus for my entire career has been cancer and I have a master's degree in pain management, <laughs> but I haven't actually looked specifically. Um, but I, I will be doing that, Eric. That is next on my list and I will be doing that. Um, so, yeah, I, so I can't talk with... Um, I can't talk about a body of evidence or or a rationale for why the the cancer pain is separated from non-cancer pain in the body of research or in how people talk about it. I I yeah. can't say specifically why. Yeah. I mean we could get into big philosophical discussion about, you know, pain is pain and it's an experience and all that stuff, but we'll save that for another another episode, maybe. <laughs> it's a whole different sure. that's that's a whole different conversation there. It is a whole different different it is a whole different conversation, but it does bring up the fact that no matter who you're working with and no matter for what reason, you're still working with the whole person. And pain yeah. is distressing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pain is distressing and and we can help soothe somebody and and um I mean the secondary results of experiencing pain I think are common regardless of the reason for the pain and that is distress and possibly anxiety and depression and insomnia and a withdrawal from um, activities or relationships that people usually engage in that they love and that they find meaningful um, those things I think can be the same regardless of the cause of the pain and so that's where I still feel that massage therapy can be very can be beneficial for sure we don't need to be scared of working with people who have cancer related pain. No. And I think that's a really important thing to, 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 to say too, is that, you know, there's not a lot of good evidence that anything really works well for pain, whether it's, you know, um, you know, pain occurring because of, you know, cancer or, or other various other reasons. We know that nothing really works very well for pain, but I think that when we're, when you see particularly if we want to just take a quick, detour into like the social media discussions on these things what we see all the time is that people are like well exercise doesn't work well for pain or stretching doesn't work well for pain or massage doesn't work well for pain but i think what you often see in those situations is you see people having these conversations looking at big data rather than but there is certain people that do respond well to massage there is certain people that do respond well to exercise there's people that do respond well to kind of stretching or strengthening programs and it seems to me that there's um we need to kind of tailor the intervention to what the person wants and the converse that conversation is often is often missed and you know so people might be listening to this and be like well there's no good evidence to suggest that you know massage works well for people with cancer pain but it might not just be the pain it might be the experience and like you said the soothing and the the, the safe place and maybe yes their pain might not change much but maybe their perceive their experience of their suffering or their uh, their journey going through that treatment or that recovery might be better by being within the presence and the uh, the experience of getting a massage. And that's the, that's a conversation that I feel is missed a lot in, in these, when we're looking at what's the evidence suggest and think, yeah, we, we do need to follow the evidence. We want to be evidence-based, but there is a part of us that says, okay, what, 
you know, as long as we are not making wild claims that we are fixing things or that we are the best and the only option for people that have cancer related pain, then there's nothing wrong with saying that we can provide a very powerful, very real role in that person's experience of dealing with, with cancer and its related complications. I agree with you. I think, as you said, that when looking at the data and these, these large studies, that the subtle nuances of an individual case or even um, a, gr a group of people, that that gets missed, unfortunately. And it's really unfortunate that we are missing these subtle nuances because that's part of the complexity of being human. So let's take a look at pain. If someone is experiencing a lot of pain, they may not be sleeping very well. And we do know that um, good quality sleep is really important for helping somebody manage their pain. And so massage then, if we can um, give them a really soothing, feel good experience, we know the research talks about how contextual factors are significant contributors to successful outcomes. And so somebody comes in and they have a really good relationship with their therapist and they come into a treatment room that has dim lighting and soothing music and they're lying comfortably on the massage table and they're warm and they're cozy under the blanket and they are able to relax and they are able to calm their nervous system and they are able to go home afterwards and have a really good nap. And maybe they sleep better for the next few nights after that. I do believe that that is going to improve their experience of their pain. It's not to say that it's going to take away their pain, but in terms of their, their over, the overall quality of their life and the overall experience, um, we're improving some of the other things that surround, um, that develop around that experience of pain. This is uh, where sense? I, hundred percent makes sense. I, I love that. I love that statement right there. I'm glad this is recorded so we can come back to that. That's really, really, <laughs> but I think also too, and, and, and tell me if, if I'm assuming you're going to agree, but uh, this is where I would see that there's what, where our profession really would benefit from a lot of qualitative research where we're looking more at the stories, the personal experiences, how people, uh, how they experience getting a massage in those situations. And you get that kind of data. I feel, and this is you know my, my experience in, in my limited research uh, that I have done uh, is the qualitative stuff is really, I, I feel where our profession should put its energies. There's not a lot of research out there in a profession. We know that specific to massage therapy. But if we had more qualitative stuff, that would provide us, I think, a richer set of, of data um, to draw from rather than looking at these big data of like signing numbers to things. Because how do you sign a number to a person's experience? I find that I just don't Now, Maybe some academic or some philosophical person would, 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 would be able to, to poke a hole in that. But for our profession, which is not overly academically inclined, like where we don't have a lot of PhDs or master's educated people. We have a lot of people, you know, that do great work, you know, with, with, with individuals in, in the clinic every day, but to, to, to inform our uh, kind of academic academia for the profession, we should really feel, we should really fo be focusing on those, the, that qualitative data because assigning a number to somebody's experience is just, it seems so dismissive. It does feel dismissive. Yeah. It does feel dismissive, and know. and and that bothers me at a at a human level. Hmm. Uh, if, if I go on in academia, and I'm I don't know necessarily that I will, but if I do, it will be in qualitative research. I don't have a lot of experience with qualitative research, but given that I come from the humanities, my undergraduate degree is in English and social history. And I worked in book publishing for 12 years. <laughs> I am all about stories. And, and what, I, what I understand about qualitative research is that it would be sort of similar to studying the humanities where you interview a whole bunch of people and then you take a look at the stories that they tell and you look for common themes. Um, and that is what then provides your, your, your data. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And to your point about, um, 
I, I think it provides a very rich data and, and that includes these subtle nuances that are so important to the human experience that a more binary, numerical, quantitative approach just doesn't capture. It's like, it's like the richness of the human experience slips through the sieve of quantitative data sometimes. Um, and I think that storytelling is important to us as humans because it is through stories that we come to understand ourselves and our experiences, and that's where we find meaning. And I think that as we work with people, it's important for us as therapists to understand that this is an important way for us to relate to people. And I think that storytelling far more than facts and statistics is a way to help change people's minds and to help change people's behavior as well. So whether you're looking to um, help somebody reconceptualize their pain maybe and understand that their the level of pain they feel doesn't correlate with a level of tissue damage or whether you're hoping to motivate somebody to be better with their rehab exercises, their self-care. I think that um, understanding that storytelling um, is a better way to be effective in communicating that to them and, and, and persuading them of something than throwing a bunch of stats and, stats and statistics. For sure. And I even think the anti-smoking campaign that became so prevalent across Canada in the 80s, I think they found the same thing. Like you can throw statistics at people about the number of smokers who develop lung cancer, and that's not as effective as a more compelling emotional human story that, that engages people's emotions and that they can relate to. I love that, Susan. It's true because we are emotional creatures. Right? We people respond more to emotions than they do to logic. You know, you can you can know all the numbers and and all that, but if it it doesn't it doesn't mean the same thing to you as if it appeals to your 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 emotions and and your feelings and uh, and that, and I and also like for our profession because of how we work because of how we're educated, stories to me seem more powerful than just giving numbers and data to to people and and also too for 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 patients clients um, is that the people come to seek our care is if we have, you know, if we uh, can share with people that, oh, in the, in, you know, people in this, in, in your, with your presentation, or let's say oncology, people with cancer, this is how they, this is, this is some data that suggests how they benefit. And you can give them like, yeah, themes, you give them stories, you can give them like little bullet points of, of, of what a common experience is of getting massage maybe during post breast cancer surgery or something versus being like, well, in 30% of the cases, you know, this is blah, 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 blah. People like that doesn't, that's not as meaningful as, as, as that story. And, and, and for me, you know, like my, my experience, you know, that when I did my master's, I did mine in, in qualitative. So the little bit of research that I have done um, is, is, is qualitative, which was story. So right? getting people's stories and developing themes. And once you get that saturation and it gives you a, a, an idea of, of, what people of their experience. Yeah. And I love that. It's, yeah. it's, I think it's better. And so good for you. Go finish your, go do some more education. We're never finished. Education. <laughs> do some. more. So one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, Susan, we could talk all day about this stuff, which is, which is great. So maybe I'll have to get you on a second time, but, <laughs> or a third time maybe, uh, is, is one thing I, before, like, I'd like, I want to get into, I want you to tell us kind of about your, your journey, about being a CE provider and, and kind of some of the things you you want to you want to do, but I guess the first thing I think which is really important, and, and this is something that's really important to me, is that in our profession we have so many myths and so many belief based systems, and we know that it's very common still. We're generalizing here, and a lot of the massage curriculums across the country, probably across the world, the way they teach about cancer and, and massage are not based on evidence. What are kind of some of the main cancer myths that you think need to change and some things that I'm sure you'll be addressing in your courses? Well, I thought that this was um, an outdated myth that had gone the way of the dodo and was really surprised to hear just a couple of months ago um, from an RMT that I know that she had a colleague who turned a client away because the client had cancer. And so I think this woman showed up for her massage appointment and, and then was sent home because the RMT said, I can't massage you because you have cancer. And that's horrifying to me. It's horrifying to me because it's factually incorrect. There's a significant body of research now that shows that massage does not spread cancer. 
And it's horrifying to me because this poor woman didn't, I, I don't know why she was going in for a massage. Maybe she just wanted to have a really feel good, relaxing experience. Um, you know, she's stressed. I don't know why, or maybe she had specific concerns that she wanted addressed, but now she's afraid to ever have a massage again because she thinks that the massage is gonna spread her cancer. And trust me, many, many people, long after they have been told by their oncologists that they are now cancer free and they are in remission, they still are so afraid that the cancer is going to reappear. Um, and so if somebody has been told by their massage therapist that massage spreads cancer, are they ever going to book another massage appointment? And that's terrible because they're missing out on so much really beneficial, really good, easily accessible human care. I mean, mammals, we, we are designed to be touched. We benefit so much from touch. We need to be touched. And um, so I was really upset to hear that. So that would be the number one myth. I want RMTs to understand that it is completely safe to massage people with cancer. Of course, you need to do a thorough intake and there are modifications that you might have to make in your massage, in your treatment plan. But generally speaking, it is safe to massage people with cancer. Um, sometimes you still hear, again, things that that are outdated and I and I don't believe in any way are substantiated by current research things like you shouldn't get too close or touch somebody who's currently going through radiation treatment because I don't know they might be radioactive I mean that sounds so ridiculous I had I had I, I had somebody say this ask me about this is this a problem and I said in absolutely no way is it unsafe to be near or to touch somebody who's going through radiation? I do remember when I was a very young girl, I might've been six or seven, my neighbor's grown up daughter was going through treatment for cancer. And I remember her saying how sad it was that while she was going through radiation, she couldn't pick up her little dogs because it might make them ill. So clearly that be belief was circulating. I mean, this would have been in the early eighties, but come on, like, we're 40 years or more beyond that. So, so let's put that to bed. Um, I've also heard myths around when somebody is going through chemotherapy, they need to use a different bathroom in their house than the rest of their family because I don't know, they might be toxic. It, it's hard to it's hard to say why, what people are afraid might happen. And as I said, it sounds kind of ridiculous. Um, that also is, is no longer true. And it is not at all unsafe to massage somebody who is actively going through chemotherapy. We're not gonna pick up anything through their skin. We don't need to wear gloves when we massage them. So, so those are some of the myths that I'd, I'd like to do away with. And I'd like to really um, educate massage therapists on all of the many benefits that massage can offer somebody who's going through cancer treatment from helping to alleviate specific complications that may arise from the treatment. I mean, surgery, people um, may want some work on, on scar tissue or um, restricted range of motion or a feeling of tightness following radiation. The tissue does sort of contract and become more leathery and radiation fibrosis can occur. Um, as, I, as I've said already, um, anxiety, depression, insomnia, Massaging can be really good, but there's even just at this human level that I feel in my gut and that I don't need research to tell me about. It's the benefit of coming in and in a warm, safe place with a trusted therapist, receiving some really kind, nurturing touch. And that is just a basic human thing. And how wonderful that we can offer that to people. That's a simple thing. It's easy, it's easy to access, and it goes such a long way in helping somebody in their overall well-being. I, I think that's that's such a great thing to, to, to say and to really, I think, a thing for us to, to emphasize, because that's where our profession really excels compared to other musculoskeletal professions is the time that we have and that safe space we can have. And this is not to 
diminish the impacts of, of other MSK providers. But what we have really is, is we, people will often come to see us because they don't, we don't necessarily fix, right? People often go to see a physio or a chiropractor because they expect this instant fix or this, this, this plan to get them out of their pain. Whereas people can often come to see us and as part of like a management plan, which is kind of, I think what you were saying is they can come to us and we can be there to hold, to be safe with them, to make them feel good and to support them, right? Supported self-management, which is a term I, I, I love. I, I don't take credit for that, but um, when I first was first heard that term, I just like resonated with me so well, because we often see that we see people as they're going through this, this journey, through this progression of whatever it is that's going, whether it's cancer or another pain problem or anything. Um, and we, 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 we support the whole person uh, rather than just like, oh, you've got pain in your low back. I'm going to, I'm going to treat your low back. No, we, we treat the, the, the human and we have time for that and the space as well as the expectation too, I believe that works in our favor is people come to see us just because they want to feel good, not because they necessarily need to have something completely alleviated. And sometimes they do things get alleviated completely, but sometimes maybe not. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I know the physio college in Ontario has an emphasis on, um, now these are my words, not their words. So um, I apologize if I'm misconstruing, mis misconveying what I think one of their standards is, but I think that they have a focus on find the problem, fix the problem, and then discharge the patient. And, and certainly I'm not saying that we should be encouraging a dependency on us, um, quite the opposite. But to your point, Eric, that people often don't come to us because they have a specific problem that they want to resolve. Maybe they do, but often people come because they really enjoy massage and because it helps them manage stress and um, muscle tension that results from um, sitting too long, from how stress manifests in their body. Um, it helps with their mood, it, all kinds of reasons. And I think that sometimes we can poo poo and diminish um, that aspect of the human experience and how massage can legitimately help people. And I, I mean, it's kind of a funny thing. I think in a way as massage therapy has wanted to legitimize itself and, and be taken more seriously in the health world that we have tried to follow in the footsteps of our physio colleagues as one example. And so be more focused on orthopedic assessment and rehabilitation. And definitely there is a really important place for that, but that's not all that there is to being human, is there? <laughs> and as you said, we have something to offer that no other health professional does and let's not diminish that. So I, I think that we should instead try and legitimize the benefits of, I, I feel like I'm being repetitive, but the benefits of coming into a safe place with a trusted therapist and having um, kind nurturing touch. Yeah. You know, I, th I think it's really interesting that in maternity wards and in prenatal education, there's a great emphasis on the importance of skin-to-skin -skin contact for newborns because skin-to-skin -skin contact uh, fosters attachment, which is crucial for a mammal's survival, unlike lizards or you know, other kinds of animals. Um, mammals are completely dependent on caregivers for their survival for the first however long of their life. Um, and so attachment is, is, it's crucial that we form healthy attachments with our caregivers. So skin to skin contact fosters attachment. Um, it calms the nervous system and it helps the brain form synapses and, and really crucial brain development in those first stages of, of life. So if we recognize that and skin to skin contact is part of our education for new parents, how come we don't recognize the importance of skin to skin contact throughout the lifespan? Why are we dismissing the benefits of massage as one way that people can receive kind, nurturing skin to skin contact? Why are we not acknowledging how crucially valuable this is for our well being as humans? And I think coming out of a pandemic where people have been isolated and I mean, sometimes really, really isolated. I mean, do you remember at the beginning, we were afraid to go six feet close to somebody and we weren't leaving our houses. 
um, as well as the tremendous increased stress that we incurred because of the pandemic across many fronts. I think that the benefits of touch are even more valuable now. Oh, I would agree 100%. And it's interesting that we have these. It's it's interesting that, you know, you said a few minutes ago that the profession, you know, we try to be a lot like other MSK providers, like physios with orthopedics and stuff, which, like, I agree, there, there's a, a time and a place for that. But it is really interesting that, you know, our profession, you know, really worked hard to get legit to be legitimized by focusing on this kind of very biomechanical pathoanatomical model. But really, the evidence suggests the stuff that we don't focus on actually has more value in a lot of cases. It's so there's this this um, discrepancy in terms of like how we're educated, how we're supposed to treat, how our colleges even actually want us to to interact with the, the public versus what's the what's kind of best practice or what's the the evidence suggest might suggest that yeah some of this other stuff that we're trying to be dismissive of probably better to focus on that but it's it's the stakeholders aren't 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 there yet in agreeing i guess on how to guide us towards towards that so that's something anyway that's something i i I think about way too much and (laughs) (laughs) yeah well i think even within the massage community itself i think i think i mean sometimes you you pick up in online conversations among rmts that you know, some RMTs kind of poo-poo the relaxation massage or poo-poo RMTs who choose to work in spas because it's not therapeutic. <laughs> um, and again, I think that that's a real shame. I really think that's a real shame. And, and I, uh, Amanda Baskell's doctoral thesis looked at this, didn't it? Didn't she say she identified the massage profession has an identity crisis yeah. where even we are not sure, are we therapeutic are we really healthcare providers working in clinics or are we working in spas along with estheticians and why does it have to be one or the other why can't we integrate why can't we integrate both of those into our into our what we offer as massage therapists you know one of my one of my guiding principles i've said this a few times publicly full credit to one of my teachers at Sutherland Chan Michelle Francis Smith One time, almost in passing, she said to my class, uh, this was in term two, and so we were learning more about specific health conditions and pathologies and how to treat those as massage therapists. And so I know that some members of my class were wanting to do that more, that sort of more advanced massage rather than just, just, in quotation marks, a relaxation massage. And so Michelle said to us, every massage, every treatment should take place within the context of relaxation because it's when we're relaxed that we're best able to heal. And, and I, need, I need to contact Michelle and tell her how foundational that has been to me. That has been a guiding principle for me as a massage therapist for this whole past 10 years. And I firmly believe that um, even when I am looking to address very specific issues um, in the tissues, physiological issues, um, I am still looking to provide that within an experience that feels good um, that is soothing, that offers um, in these contextual ways, offers an overall positive experience. I'm not a believer in the no pain, no gain mentality. I don't think that people need to be hurt in order to receive the benefits of massage. To the contrary, I think that can often be really counterproductive. So I'm in the context of relaxation camp and then looking more specifically at what we're looking to achieve. And I agree with that too. The, the no pain, no gain thing, you know, is, is something that is so common in, in not just our profession and all MSK professions, uh, but also in society. It's a, it's a thing, like if it hurts, it's, it's doing good. And, and this is where it gets into this very subjective thing. And, and in the courses I teach, I talk about this all the time is, you know, I, and I've, I think I've said this before in some other of these podcasts I've, I've done is I talk about, you know, TPN, right. Or as, as it was used when you put that in your uh, article, TPK, touch people nicely or touch people kindly. And touch then, people kindly. Yeah. And, and, and it's, 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 it's that, that could be in some, depending on the person that could be a little bit harder, that could be a little bit uncomfortable for the person if that's what they feel works for them. And some people might just be light or it might be somewhere in the middle and it could be pokey, it could be stretchy, it could be swimmy techniques. It doesn't really matter as long as you're doing something that feels good, 
then that is should be the the goal, right? Should be soothing or feel good to the person, uh, and and yeah, and so that's when we have these conversations about like the relaxation, for example. I feel that a lot of people when they hear relaxation, they think lying face down, lots of oil, just big Swedish techniques, but that could be it. And that might be what you get at a spa, but that might not be it. It could be something totally different because it's individual. It's based on the person. So the term relaxation, I feel is something that isn't really well defined because it's, 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 it's person dependent. Mm -hmm. Subjective. So that's something that, that probably should be talked about more in the profession is when we talk about the names of what we expect for the relaxation, for example, you know, what's that mean? What is that? I know. I know. And then you can get into the whole topic of like the menu, the massage menu. <laughs> you know, when you go on a clinic website and it's like a menu and you choose which type of massage you want. And that bugs me because again, it's, we don't need to create these silos. I mean, depending on what the massage therapist and the client discuss, what the client is looking for, what the massage therapist suggests, you know, you can you can mix them all in together. I hate the menu. <laughs> I I uh, I agree with you. I hate the menu too. I, it drives me crazy actually when you see stuff and people like they'll like this is this is this is the, your choices and you think well shouldn't it be something that you discuss with the person you know like you're making them choose but maybe you should have a discussion with them and see what they want to that day and then you can give them a recommendation of like well this is what i think would work for you and you have that you know person-centered care you know you share decision making all those buzzwords to try and find out what works best for that person on that day yeah the menu thing drives me crazy too another thing that drives me crazy and this is my podcast so i can say whatever the hell i want <laughs> is <laughs> is is all the, the the named techniques of everything like that 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 drives me crazy it's like oh i'm this type of therapist and you insert their favorite acronym here and and, and that is something i feel is I don't know. It's it's almost too reductionist because you're treating a person. You're not treating, you can use those techniques, but why do people advertise those techniques? And I think it's because people feel that the public really wants that. I'm sure someone's going to listen to this and be like, well, my patients, they come in, see me because I do whatever. I'm thinking, yeah, but that's because you advertise that. I bet you if you just said, I my special area of interest is in oncology. It doesn't matter what techniques you use. People are going to be like, oh, I want to see this person um, because this is their area of interest or chronic pain, or, um, maybe it's orthopedics, maybe it's sport, maybe it's whatever, right? There's a lot of different, uh, avenues that we can go, but the, the name techniques and the menu, those things are top of my list. Two things drive me crazy. I would love to see those get thrown out or put in the back seat for the profession. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And it's a slow transition away from it for, not only for the public, but also for us as therapists and how we communicate with each other. I've talked with my colleagues sometimes about, you know, myofascial release and stuff like that. And to be honest with you, I still write MFR in my treatment notes only because I know that my colleagues will, will have a, a general idea of what it is that I was doing. I don't actually believe that I am that I am releasing, I don't know, adhesions between layers of fascia or something like that. But, but as a, you know, as a general term for what it was that I was doing on that, that part of that person's body to address the issues that they said they wanted uh, resolved or, or uh, sorry, that they wanted to be addressed in the treatment. It, it's a shorthand. It's a form of communication between colleagues because we have all come from a very similar kind of training. And I don't just mean my massage colleagues. I mean my physio colleagues as well. So oh. it, it's going to be it's going to be a slow transition as we as we all find another way of communicating what it is that we're doing. Well, I'm a, I'm a big fan of making up stupid acronyms for things. So I always I always joke, and I, instead of MFR, I just call it Triple ST, Slow Stretchy Skin <laughs> Technique. It's, you know, that's kind of what you're doing usually. So, uh, and yeah. it doesn't, it, it works like it works for a lot of people. And, and when we look at the, the neurophysiology, you know, we know well, it's suggested that certain, you know, anti nociceptive uh, triggers uh, occur when you put slow stretch into, into tissue that's not overly noxious. And anyway, I just, <laughs> I, I think when people hear these things, and this is probably the part of the problem is people hear, well, we can't release fascia. 
And they're like, but they're like, but I get results. I'm like, well, I'm not saying that you're not getting results. We're not challenging your outcome. We're challenging your, your story narrative. narrative about that outcome. And the reasons are not for what you think they are, but they could be for these other things. So rather than releasing fascia, let's just say you're just slowly stretching the skin and yeah. impacting sensors and receptors and stuff. Magic happens and hopefully the person feels better. Yeah. And allowing time for the person's nervous system to respond and adapt to the yeah. stimuli that you're providing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's, I'm going to do, actually, I think I'm going to do a whole, a whole series of episodes on modalities and, and talking about that. So I mean, I'll come back to this for anyone that's listening. I'll come back to that later. I think and talk about, I'm, I'm very curious. I'm very, that's something I'm very, when I first started teaching, that was what I did is I spent so much time just kind of breaking down you know, stories about the different things and be like, there's no evidence to support this. So let's, we, let's change our, our story about it. And that was a lot of resistance, but I think as time's moved on, you know, I've been at this for about eight years now, things are slowly starting to change, but I was really expecting change to happen quicker. <laughs> yeah. Change is always slow and that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. And, you know, I think going back to what we were talking about earlier about the power of stories that, that I think it's just a human thing, that stories are how we come to understand things. Um, and it's a tool to communicate effectively as well and persuasively. And I think that that's part of the reason why these narratives have become so entrenched, um, because it's a way of explaining that makes sense to people what we think we're doing, or what we think is happening when we touch people in this way. And then that story spreads because stories do spread easily especially if it's an so, attractive story if it's a story if it's a story yeah. that kind of sounds like really interesting and that's really cool that's really powerful it's neat that you can do that and i know i i i'm a victim to those stories too when i first started practicing and even now too right you're a little more skepticism you still get attracted to certain stories because they kind of maybe tweak your interest or confirm a bias or you like it but you know we have to be mindful that a story without evidence is just a story yeah, like, exactly. It's not exactly. And therefore we have to be careful about the stories that we tell. <laughs> yeah. We have a, and this is something <laughs> story, I, 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 stories sorry. are powerful. They are. But they can be yeah. powerful for the good and powerful for the bad. Yeah. And this is a whole thing I always talk I keep coming back to is we have an, as healthcare providers, if we want to be healthcare providers, whether that is working in a spa, whether it is working in a clinic, or whether it's working in whatever it is, we do have an ethical obligation to be as less wrong as possible. So we should be following evidence as whenever we don't know. And if we don't know, we could say, well, in my experience, this is my anecdotal experience. This is might work. This might not work, but we don't know why. I think as long as you're honest about it with people, that that's fine. But the problem I see is that when we make these wild claims without evidence, any evidence to support it. Oh, I took this course on the weekend and this is what they told me what to do. And so, and this is the story they told. And then that story is just made up. That's what drives me yeah. crazy. And that's a problem in not just our profession, but I think in all MSK professions. And I'm hopefully that stuff will start to change as, as we move on. Um, but one thing kind of like <laughs> we wanted to bring you on today to talk about was about your journey as a CE instructor. And I know you're new to it and and your course. So let's let's just kind of go back to that, because I think otherwise we could just talk about this other stuff, which is, I think, really important. I love it. And uh, but I think, you know, let, let's hear a bit more about about your course. So oncology massage do you have a title for it yes what's your title uh right now the title is oncology massage oh look at that <laughs> I brilliant I, I i don't have a more specific title but yes yeah, so i am i'm working on creating this course i want to launch it in fall 2023 so let's hope <laughs> that i look i just said it publicly so now i have to that's my <laughs> that's gonna be my my kick in the butt um to really keep going um so yes, as I said, I want to, what I want RMTs to take away from my course is uh, that it is safe to massage people with cancer. And importantly, that massage is really beneficial. It's beneficial for um, helping to alleviate specific complications related to treatment for cancer and, and a, a larger picture in a more general sense for just helping support somebody through what is a really difficult time. And helping with their overall well-being, with minimizing depression and anxiety and insomnia, and helping them feel better, and and providing some kind, nurturing touch at a time when the other medical interventions that they're receiving are can be kind of horrible. You know, it's it's 
it's hard to go through surgery and it's hard to go through chemotherapy and it's hard to go through radiation and it's hard to go through hormone therapy. And um, here is something that, that can feel good and can be helpful. Um, so that's what I want RMTs to know. And, and as I said, I do see a need for this education in our profession. Um, it's so important. I think that every RMT is going to encounter people who have been through cancer treatment. And so I want to really provide a lot of valuable evidence-based information for RMTs so that they can be really confident in what they're telling people and what they're offering people um, so that people know that it can be beneficial. From what, what I hear from my patients, um, sometimes they say that they really wish they had been told sooner that they should come for physio and or massage, that, that it can be really beneficial. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're are told about the benefits right off the bat, and that's great. But, um, and I don't say this to disparage physicians, um, but what I hear from my patients is that going through the cancer treatment, of course, the people that they're seeing are the oncologists, the medical oncologists, the surgeons, the radiation oncologists, and those people, rightly so, are focused on the cancer. And so when somebody comes to them and says, um, I'm feeling pain or, um, I, I can't lift my arm up. Or my chest feels really, really tight and uncomfortable um, or any number of complications that are related to the treatment, they often feel dismissed by their oncologist because to the oncologist, that's not that important. And, and the oncologists have very limited time. And as I said, they're focused on the cancer. That's their job, they're oncologists. So being referred to other health professionals who have training in in helping people with these other symptoms and other experiences is really important. And I think massage therapists are really well positioned to offer tremendous care to people. So that's that's what I want to do. And I and I um yeah I, I want to empower I want to empower RMTs wherever they are across Canada that, that they can offer something so valuable. And it's like you said at the beginning, right? 20% of people are going to experience cancer in their lifetime. So this yep. is not like it's a small, tiny little niche population that, you know, a couple percentage of people get it. It's This is a big, big concern. And there's a lot of opportunities for our profession to support and help people. And so this is, this is, this is, I think it is really great. Now, one question, I guess I, I, I don't know the answer to, which was actually, I shouldn't say one question. There's a lot of questions I don't know the answers to, but one thing I'm, I'm curious about for, for, for you, is there other, is there any other oncology massage courses out there in Canada? Um, I'm forgetting the name. There is the online course provided by an RMT in BC. Eric, do you know who I'm talking about? Oh, I'm Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'm not going to use their name, but yeah, I do know there is that. Yeah, I'm I'm blanking. I know Jocelyn Curtin is very interested in developing some and is likely working on it right now. Um, but otherwise, I don't know of any oncology massage courses that are available in Canada for right. RMTs specifically. Yeah, Embodia, yeah. the online uh, education resource, has some courses that are created by a physiotherapist, again, whose name escapes me, um, but she's very experienced. I know she developed the rehab program that Toronto Rehab offers specifically for people who've been through treatment for Wellspring. So I haven't taken that course, but I am sure that it's um, it's well done and, and reputable. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not... Uh, that's created by a physiotherapist and maybe geared towards physiotherapist more more towards um, exercises and rehab and strengthening. Um, it's not specific to massage. Right. So specifically from and, and as and as you and I have said, we work differently. We work differently than other health professionals to our benefit, to our patients' benefit. So. Um, Courses on working with people with cancer that are specifically geared toward massage therapists? No, there's there's really not a lot. Yeah. So there's a huge gap to, to, to fill here because it's a huge population. There's not a lot of education on it for RMTs in, in Canada. There might be, I think there is a group in the U.S. where I've seen they do stuff on oncology massage, but uh, they're, you know, they might, it might be more hospital based. I'm not, I'm not sure. And I, so I don't want to say, because I don't know, but I do. Yeah. So now you said that I do, there is a, there is a, a course 
that's taught by a group or some people here in BC. Um, I don't know though, from at least, hmm, I don't want to get in trouble. I, I haven't heard that it's very evidence-based. I heard it's more about beliefs rather than like incorporating a lot of like science and best practices into it. So yeah. it's there that might just from the stuff I've heard. That's why I don't want to say the name. Cause I don't want to get in trouble by throwing somebody specifically under the bus. But the, the course you're talking about, I, I have heard from people who have taken it that they were disappointed because it was based on personal experience, not based on like any research to support what they were saying. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such a shame, isn't it? I mean, that's how huge opportunity. Myths myths. Get, yeah. And, and that's how myths get perpetuated as well, unfortunately. Now, I, I will say, because I have looked into the research on uh, massage and say chemotherapy or massage and um, radiation therapy, for example, one of the one of the obstacles that I run into when I look into the research is that often massage is not necessarily the primary intervention that's being studied and massage itself is not very well defined. And so what exactly is the massage therapist doing? What's the duration of the massage? What's the frequency of the massage? And so it can be hard to take the research, the body of research that exists so far as being really substantial. But I think that's true for massage across many topics, that there's not as much research as there could be, which is why we need to suggest that more and more massage therapists <laughs> pursue education and pursue research, because there's there's so much that we could learn. Yeah. And that's the way forward, I, I feel, for the profession. We need more, more of that kind of academic base to... to, to... To draw from but yeah i would say though like so yeah we could talk about like yeah you could say that about any course there's not a lot of massage there's not a lot of, a lot of specific massage therapy research for it and we'll use cancer as an example there's not a lot and i agree that at least a little bits of stuff i've read it says massage but it doesn't like i said it's not there's no definition really it's like massage therapy but what is that massage therapy is a profession is it like what is there a specific techniques or any specific areas you're working in? like what does that mean uh, but the biggest yeah. thing that i see is a problem with the CE industry is that a lot of time it's people are basing it on their personal experience, which is totally fine as long as you're honest about that. But it's, it's oftentimes it's the narratives perpetuated that are incorrect that aren't based on biologically plausible principles. So let's say, for example, you know, you're teaching a course on cancer for breast cancer, whatever. And you're like, Oh yeah, well, when you get courting, it's because you've got these like, myofascial adhesions here that are locking everything up and and you're like but there's no that's there's no evidence to support that you're just making that up because that's what you think or that's what you want to believe or that's what you've heard from somebody else or you know yeah, we're going to break down scar tissue with frictions you're like well that we that doesn't happen because there's no evidence to support that so you can't say you shouldn't be saying that but what you said is true is that people take those courses and it's it's told with a compelling story yep very believable, very passionate educator. And then people are like, oh, that is, so yeah, when you come in, you've got you know, restricted range of motion and you've got courting, it's because of this and I'm going to go and I'm going to do this thing. And you are telling people, your, your, your clients, a story that is not supported by biologically plausible principles. That's, in, that's potentially harmful. It is. I think that we, as professionals, Need to become more comfortable with uncertainty. We we need to be able to say, uh, courting is not really well understood. We we don't really understand what it is that's going on when somebody experiences courting. We know that it uh, can occur in this percentage of women following treatment for breast cancer, and there seems to be a correlation between thin women and um, courting. We don't know exactly why, and. Um, uh, we know that there's an increased risk of developing lymphedema if somebody has courting. Those are correlations that we've seen, but we can't say for sure why. We, we can't say exactly what is happening physiologically or what the mechanism is at play. And, and I think that it's okay. And I actually think that it's better if we say the research isn't conclusive on this yet, because at least that suggests, and hopefully that's true, that we have investigated fairly thoroughly the body of research to date. And so we can say that with confidence. The, re the research is not really conclusive yet. <laughs> we'll keep studying and hopefully get more information. And that's honest. That's that. It is honest. Uh, and that's that's being just honest, which uh, as a CE instructor, I, I strongly believe that you have to be honest and say, when you don't know, just say you don't know. 
And it's hard sometimes when you're in a room with uh, a bunch of people and they ask you these questions. You think, that's a good question. I don't know. And that's okay. I, I think people, my experience, in my experience, uh, when, when you are, when you say you don't know and, and you're like, I, that's a good question. I'll look into it. Or, you know, can you contact me after the course and maybe we can have a discussion about that more? That, that is, I think says a lot for you as an educator that you're you're willing to listen and you're willing to accept when you don't know when you have gaps in your knowledge because we don't know there's lots of stuff we don't know and the more we learn the more we don't know it's just the way it yes. is yeah. absolutely so uh so one thing i wanted to ask you was about your course so it's gonna keep gonna kind of finish up the, the conversation about your course specifically if you could summarize and put you on the spot here in like two to three sentences maximum hopefully not really long sentences, but as specific as possible, what would be kind of two to three kind of key things that people would get after taking your course that would benefit them in practice when treating people with cancer? They would learn the uh, pathology of cancer and how cancer spreads. And that will help um, arm them uh, for the conversation about the risk of massage spreading cancer and how we know that that doesn't take place. They will learn about what happens when somebody goes through specific treatments for cancer, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, et cetera. They will learn about common complications related to those um, treatments for cancer. They will learn um, how they might need to modify their massage for somebody who is currently go or has recently been through those specific treatments. And they will learn how massage therapy can benefit somebody who may have complications from those treatments for cancer. And so in essence, I hope that it will empower RMTs to confidently deliver safe and effective massage therapy for people through all stages of cancer who are currently actively going through cancer treatment, who have recently finished, maybe who are several years beyond, beyond cancer, treatment. And um, I will also include in the course um, a little bit of talk about palliative care, because unfortunately, if you are working with people with cancer, there is always the risk that cancer will be the cause of their death and they will continue to seek care um, at the end of their life. <clears throat> and very importantly, I'll also talk about um, self-care for the massage therapist, because it can, although it can be enormously rewarding and very fulfilling to work with people through their treatment for cancer and beyond. Um, and there is an emotional intimacy that often develops in the therapeutic relationship. We need to be careful about our boundaries and we have to recognize when that is taking a toll on us. It, it is really hard to see a patient that you've become fond of decline and maybe suffer and pass away. It, that can be really hard and we need to talk about that. I, I think we can't pretend that that doesn't exist. It is part of the part of the work. That is such an important thing too that we don't often, you don't hear about in, in courses is the self-care for, for you as the, as, the, as the therapist, you know, uh, the person delivering the care and what's the impact on, on you. And, and that, that's actually, I, that's something I think that'd be very, very unique for your course, which will probably be very, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a very important piece of knowledge or awareness for, for, for people, for learners to take is, is how to be more aware of, of and present with that experience of what, what you're going to feel something. You're going to experience something too, potentially in these, particularly in palliative cases. Oh, completely. And even just as I said, working with somebody who may be suffering. I mean, I, I, you know, I've worked with some people at the end stage of their life and their symptoms are so advanced and they're in a lot of pain possibly. And um, it can be, it can be really hard at the same. And obviously you work within what is comfortable and tolerable for the patient. You don't insist on doing things that, that are, are just too distressing for them in some way, but um, it can be distressing to see somebody just hurting so much. And it's not just the physical symptoms, but you also see somebody grapple with maybe, maybe resist, come to terms in whatever way they can with, with the end of their life. And that can be a tremendous privilege. 
I think that this comes up a lot in massage, as we've already talked about, because we spend a lot of time one-on-one with our patients in a safe, cozy, warm room context where people can let their guard down and, and they might start to share some of the things that they're feeling. And so we need to be prepared. We need to recognize the limits of our scope of practice that we're not psychotherapists or psychologists. At the same time, we are humans and we are um, working closely with another human who is, is going through a big transition and how they come to terms with what, what becomes really important to them. I mean, I can share stories if, if you want um, ahead. about some of these experiences. Well, I had a, a wonderful woman s- several years ago um, who came to me, unfortunately, she came to me because she had lymphedema in her leg. She'd had a melanoma on her shin. And unfortunately, when she came to me the first time, she said, I, I can feel these lumps in my groin. And I, I thought, oh no. Um, and it turned out, unfortunately, I don't know why it seemed to take a long time to get MRIs and things like that. But in other words, the cancer had already spread throughout her body. And so these lumps that she could feel in her groin were the enlarged lymph nodes, I think. Um, so she lived a few more months after that. Um, and I helped manage the swelling in her leg, which she sometimes would describe was like dragging around a huge sack of potatoes. Like her leg was just so large and uncomfortable. But I saw her, first of all, her struggle to try and really fight this um, and, and what she talked about she was gonna do. And she was, she was from Germany, she was gonna go back to Germany and there was this clinic there, but it was also an opportunity to see her siblings that she hadn't seen in a long time. That trip didn't, never took place. Um, how she um, worked with her granddaughter, who was about six. And um, her son had asked her, I think, to try and impart a lot of skills. And so she made a doll. And the doll was things, it was an opportunity for her to show her granddaughter and for her granddaughter to practice things like, this is how you sew on a button. And this is how you mend a rip. And this is how you hem a cuff. And, and I love that, like what, what an amazing opportunity for a grandmother and her granddaughter um, for bonding and, and imparting almost some, some family skills and family traditions. One of the stories that I found heartbreaking, um, she was admitted to the palliative care ward at Sunnybrook Hospital. And I, and I saw her there several times um, before she passed away. And one of the last things that she did, <laughs> I'm starting to, I'm starting to well up even remembering this because it's always really struck me. Um, One of the last things that she did before she was admitted to the palliative ward, she went out and she bought a whole bunch of underwear and socks for her husband to make sure that he was well taken care of after she was gone. And they had been married for decades. She was, she celebrated her 80th birthday just before she died. Um, So clearly part of their relationship was that this was one of the ways in which she took care of him. And so in in planning for her coming death, uh, it was important to her that she make sure that he was well taken care of and would have a good stock of socks and underwear in his drawers for after she was gone. I find that so touching. And that's just a little a little insight into how people prepare for the end of their life and and what's important to them and, and how they how they show love for the people around them as they come to the end of their life. Wow. Thanks for sharing that story. It's very emotional. Story. It is, isn't it? <laughs> and then you, and you can, I just hear in your voice too, that, that, you know, bringing that back, bringing that to the forward is, 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 is not easy. It's not easy. And, and, you know, that woman is one of many that I, that I carry with me. And I find, I think, I think about them often. I mean, as therapists, we, we can be really touched and we can be profoundly changed. I, it's, it is such a privilege to work with people through this time in their life. And of course, it just opens our eyes to what is a, a universal experience. We are all going to lose people and we are all going to die ourselves. We are all going to go through that transition. And so I think it really expands our own humanity and our sense of what it is to be human. I've seen similar things with other people. You know, a woman who had pancreatic cancer um, and developed ascites 
Um, and then I, th I think it was the ascites that caused the lymphedema in both of her legs, that her abdomen was just so full that the lymphatic system got compressed and couldn't move the fluid up out of her legs. She had some very specific goals. One of her daughters was getting married. She really wanted, a few months later, she really wanted to be able to wear nice shoes with her dress to her daughter's wedding. And right now her feet were so swollen that she could only fit into, I don't know, sort of large running shoes or Crocs or something. And so that was a really specific goal. And that's what we worked towards. And we, we timed things for that event. We, we timed compression bandaging in order to reduce and everything so that she could feel good about how she looked and how she was able to participate in, in her daughter's wedding. So again, it's a little insight into what becomes really important to people at the end of their life. It's so wonderful that you've been able to help those people through those, those experiences of that, that time in life too. Like it's quite an honor that somebody, you know, feels that they trust you. And that's something that's really powerful in our profession that, you know, these people, you become part of their, you become a person that's a, a real, real high importance to them as they're at that stage in their, their, their journey, their life. So that's, that's something that we, we need to really hold on to, I think, as, as a profession and we need to realize the, the important influence and, and role we can play. I know, I know for me, like I've practiced for 16 years now, almost 17 years. And the, you know, thinking back to, you know, I didn't ever had a focus on oncology or, or cancer, but I treated lots of people that had, you know, during their, during cancer or after surgeries or whatever. And, you know, a lot of them, you know, uh, so after so long, a lot of people pass away and a lot of times, you know, if they're elderly, they, they, you know, whether it's cancer or not, you know, people, people die and, and, and sometimes you're there or pretty close to near the end. And, you know, you maybe get a phone call from the, the wife or the husband or the grandkid or something. And, oh, John, you know, John's passed away. Just making names up, right? Just, um, and, and, and it always, it always, it always hurts. You know, there's always that, that, that kind of, you're kind of sinking and that kind of like, oh, they were so wonderful, you know, like, you know, and you start to, to remember your experience with them. And, and, and yeah, you feel quite privileged that you were able to have that, um, have that connection with them. Particularly mm -hmm. if there's somebody that you've seen for a, a long time. And yeah, it's hard when they go. It is hard. And you hear so many stories, you know, you learn all about their family members. I'll tell you one thing that I have learned. The woman who, uh, who had pancreatic cancer and, and her goal was to be able to wear nice shoes to her daughter's wedding. I heard all about her two daughters and some of the special things that they did together in her in the mom's um, last few months. Um, and so you really get a sense that you know the person and the family members and then and then your patient dies. And my inclination was to write to the family and, and say, I thought she was an amazing woman and it was et cetera. It was such a privilege to work with her, et cetera. But I didn't in that case because I thought, but that be, that would be kind of weird. Like it's a one sided thing where I have heard about them and I have a sense that I know something about those people, even though I've never met them. But those people probably have no idea who I have. I am and probably have never heard anything about me. And isn't it going to be kind of weird for me to write to them? I've since changed my mind about that. I, I now feel that it can be really wonderful for family members to receive a letter that just shares something about somebody else's experience with their mom or, or their dad or whoever, and, and how meaningful that relationship was. And so um, going forward, I am going to send a card to family members. Um, if I move to, I don't mean that every time, but if I move to, I'm not, I'm not going to hold back. And I think that that's okay. That's my personal, that's my personal feeling about it. I, I'm not saying that as a, <laughs> that as a profession we should be, or that any RMT should, should do. It's entirely individual. Yeah. Well, I, I would imagine too, that it'd probably be very nice for the families to, to hear that and to know that, Hey, you know, here's somebody that's, you know, new mom or new dad for, X number of years. And, you know, this is, it's, it's always nice to hear that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, so I guess we're probably, you know, this is where we're probably wrapping up here close to the end of the, the, this conversation. So I guess the one, another thing I'd like to, to hear from you just before we go is this is a kind of a, a vague kind of big question. What kind of changes would you like to see in the CEC industry? 
Oh, that is a big question. Or do you want to see any changes? It doesn't have to be that it has to be changes. I'd like to see, I, my answer to that would be sort of um, a summary of some of the things that we've talked about already today. But I'd also like to add something that I know, Eric, is a motivator for you. Um, so I'm going to start with that. Um, I remember being really pleased one day a long time ago when I heard you say that you thought that massage therapists, we, we don't need to feel that we're at the bottom of the healthcare totem pole and that we need to turn to physios or chiros or other health providers, other health professionals for our continuing education. We have a lot of really smart, educated, capable RMTs, and we can be leaders within our own profession. And I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see, um, I do think that continuing education courses need to be um, grounded in the evidence. I think they need to have a foundation of research. Um, I do think that there is room for people to share their own experience and to illustrate with stories from their practice. Um, in a way, often it's the stories, the anecdotes that students might remember and take away and that then can be good, almost like pins to remember, oh yes, this, this was a good approach or um, can, can help them remember other things, other content from the course. So I'm not saying that anecdotes and, and personal stories have no place. I think they have value, but I, do th I, I don't think that a, a continuing education course can only be based on somebody's um, clinical experience. It does need to be grounded in the evidence. So I'd like to see more um, RNTs pursue that kind of thing. And I, I would like to see us move away from modalities or really specific tissue-based things. I think that we have to remember always that we are treating a whole person. And um, we can't isolate one, we can't isolate a health condition or a pathology from that person's overall experience. We need to be prepared ourselves emotionally and psychologically um, to work with the whole person. So just going back to what we were just talking about, as an RMT working with people going through profound illness and, and possibly end of life care, we have to be self-aware enough to realize what we are comfortable with because our own issues around death and loss, illness are going to be triggered. So maybe we need to do our own personal work on some of those things. That, I think that's really important to be aware of that. That needs to be kept out of the treatment room. Our interactions with our clients are not a place for us to play out our own issues. I feel quite strongly about that. <laughs> um, the clients come to us for their own needs and we're the professionals. But um, I'd, I'd like to see more, um, I'd like to see professionals embrace working with the whole person. And that means all of the human experience, even though it might be a little bit messy and, and a little bit difficult sometimes, but that's what it is to be human. That is so well said. That was so well said. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the, and this is, yeah, this is obviously, you know, we know each other. And so we've talked, had these conversations many times uh, ourselves or with, you know, other people in like the mastermind group and whatnot in, in the various other groups that, that we're a part of is that the, the, the moving away from the modalities and more towards population-based CECs is such an important thing. And that's why I like what you're doing. You're doing oncology massage. You're focusing on a population. It's not like you're doing MLD for insert area, breast cancer or whatever, you know, you're, you're teaching about a population and then you're going to teach you know, different ways of managing or approaching or, you know, the do's and don'ts kind of thing or ideas and what's the science suggested for this population. And we need more of that. And then that, that's what you said. Uh, this is what you kind of you're getting at in there is like treating the entire person less on modalities. And that would be the thing that I would love to see for our profession is for population based learning to be the focus, because guess what? That's what every other healthcare profession does. So why are we one of the few that just decides to focus on you know, these acronym based learnings and these is like different modalities. And like, you know, when we look at the science, we know the modalities all work pretty much via the same anyway, but let's focus on learning everything we can about a population. 
so that's what that's that's what I find really attractive about your your course and what you want to do is there's a huge hole there where there's not a lot. It sounds like there's hardly any, if not zero, evidence based courses for massage therapists by massage therapists for oncology massage. And you're not teaching specific techniques. You're teaching what's this evidence suggest is the best way to approach this profession. That's what we should be learning. Mm-hmm. That just makes mm-hmm. that's not only is it logical, it's also better practice. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you so much for inviting me onto your show and giving me the opportunity to talk about this. This has been, as always, Eric, such a pleasure to chat with you and <laughs> talk about all these different things. And we've covered so many different topics. My goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was great today, Susan. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Uh, that was really fun. My pleasure. And uh, we will, I'm sure we'll be in touch with you again. So you have a good day and everybody's listening. Pay attention to Susan. Um, in the show notes, I'm going to put her contact information. And so you can reach out to her if you want to learn more from her. And uh, fall 2023, Oncology Massage with the wonderful Susan Shipton be coming towards you. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe so you can be notified of future episodes. Purpose Versus is now available on all major podcast directories. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it on your social media. If you would like to connect with me, I can be reached on my website, ericpurvis.com, or send me a DM through either Facebook or Instagram at ericpurvisrmt.